the organizers, the uh, uh, SFT, Rungs and Alliance, and particularly to Bed House and Bob in particular, uh, for hosting this event. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming here. This is uh, uh, really a packed house. I don't know if people uh, uh, on the internet uh, have had any views of uh, uh, the audience here, but uh, the room is really full. Um, the goal of this seminar, as stated in the announcement, uh, which I assume most of you have seen, reads, it is hoped that this seminar will contribute to opening up a greater national debate on this most vital development in the future of Tibet and the Tibetan people. I certainly intend to open up this debate. Uh, but while some people might uh, feel that a non-Tibetan must be circumspect in, pe in speaking about Tibetan affairs and about criticizing the Dalai Lama, I will open the door. Perhaps I'll widen it a bit by stating at the outset that the Dalai Lama, the institution, and the man, the Dalai Lama, is a political leader <coughs> like any other, and Tibet a country like any other, and both are fair subjects for commentary and critique by observers of any nationality or background. I would not disqualify criticisms of any other political leader or religious figure on the basis of the commentator's nationality, and I feel no inhibitions about offering my opinion on this subject as an observer of Tibetan affairs. So, before I begin my uh, remarks proper, in the uh, spirit of Betty Davis, uh, fasten your seat belts, it's going to be a bumpy night. <laughs> In a paper which I presented at a conference organized by Bob uh, in 2000, it was in the fall of 2000, because I remember we were uh, still going on about the uh, election, the 2000 election there. Yes. Uh, the conference was entitled Spirituality and Democracy, and there at the conference, I made the point that government by revelation is inherently illiberal. Revelation in a nutshell is the basis for choosing a Dalai Lama and was for three centuries the basis for choosing the leader of Tibet. And it is illiberal, though this is not to say unpopular. In spite of the instances of nepotism, corruption, and even suppression of the press that have occurred in exile society over the last few decades. Rule by a person considered divine by most of his subjects is hardly going to be resented. And when the person in question is largely a decent man, as is the present Dalai Lama, reckoning with the results of his errors and mistakes in both judgment and policy is a difficult matter. To put it another way, a population that has been inculcated with the sense that their own objective assessments of public issues and policies are to be subordinated to the religious, author religious authority of a revealed leader will not be making the unimpeded and informed choices and decisions that are expected in civil society under liberal structures. In essence, then, the removal of the Dalai Lama from political authority is a sine qua non. This will, uh, this will not end his sway, however, as witness the present situation wherein the Dalai Lama has ostensibly left the administration of the Tibetan government in exile to a prime minister, one who uh, conscientiously does what he thinks is acceptable to the Dalai Lama, not the Tibetan exile population at large. So if there were to be a mature Tibetan polity with the Dalai Lama, whether in exile or elsewhere, there must be an explicit perception of the Dalai Lama as a human being, like any other, capable of errors and mistakes, <coughs> some of them quite serious, a Dalai Lama who is a suitable subject for unhindered and unsentimental criticism. The absence of such a view of the Dalai Lama, articulated openly and publicly, has been a deleterious element in exile Tibetan politics for decades. I say this with full cognizance of the tremendous contribution that the Dalai Lama has made to the unity and the livelihoods of Tibetan in exile, and his central role in nurturing the movement that is now, also through his actions, sinking. Public and political figures have no uniform levels of achievement or accomplishment. They have periods of success and insight and periods of muddle and error. Lifetime tenure is no guarantee of the former, it tends rather to increase the likelihood and intensity of the latter by removing normal political checks against failure. If one is to address the problem and to seek a more uh, politically open Tibetan society in exile, it will not do to continue with the usual <coughs> periodic affirmations from some official or other to the effect that the Dalai Lama would like to have the Tibetan people voicing their opinions. He and his officials are confident that at best there, might, there may be some dissent from policy, but never a direct call for the Dalai Lama to answer for the misguided and delusional policies that he has authored. Nor will it serve any purpose for the Dalai Lama simply to acknowledge the theoretical possibility that, hypothetically, he may perhaps possibly one day make some unspecified mistake. 
The Dalai Lama would need to acknowledge one or more of the many serious mistakes he has made, mistakes which have effectively eviscerated the Tibetan movement. But not simply that. In order for Tibetans to begin to cultivate a real sense of civic equality, the Dalai Lama would also have to make it clear where he was spectacularly wrong, and that this or that, specifically named Tibetan, was actually right. In other words, he'd have to acknowledge in the most unambiguous manner possible that with regard to worldly political issues, he is no better a judge, and often a worse one, than many ordinary Tibetans who have no air of divinity attached to them. And I should stress here that uh, this would have to be done in the face, uh, 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 the face of the fact that, uh, 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 the face of what most Tibetans have been inculcated with with regard to the Dalai Lama. In other words, I'm not saying that this would be popular, but I'm saying that there needs to be some very serious education, political education, within the Tibetan population at large. I believe that this is essential if one is to have a Tibetan polity that it embraces in word and spirit the notion of equal citizenship. But I have no illusions about the Dalai Lama actually doing this, for he believes that his view of Tibet's future takes precedence over popular Tibetan aspirations. And his view, if one is to accept the accuracy with which it has been reported by Tom Laird in his The Story of Tibet, Conversations with the Dalai Lama is nothing but the fruit of a wince-inducing revelation, the master plan of Chenrezig. The Dalai Lama believes that Chenrezig set in motion a master plan over two millennia ago to bring Tibet, Mongolia, and China together, which is to say that this was at a time when there were no Tibetans and no Mongols on the face of the earth. This plan seems likely to be the sad denouement of the Dalai Lama's delusions about China and of the struggle that Tibetan exiles believe he is leading for them. As an example of the dead end that has been reached, I would re reiterate here what I said in a piece that recently appeared on Payo.com, which I think some of you have probably seen. Um, and the few comments that uh, appeared there are also instructive, though I certainly cannot say that they're representative of opinion in the Tibetan community. Therein, I pointed out that in spite of China's intentions to manage the selection of the next Dalai Lama, in spite of those intentions being known years ago, years ago, the Dalai Lama made it clear this past November and December that he had no clear plan of how to proceed with this process in exile. I noted that this was symptomatic of the Dalai Lama's wholly reactive strategy for dealing with China, which also goes hand in hand with the Dalai Lama naively allowing himself to be used by China as its most important spokesperson against Tibetan independence complying with continuous calls from China for rejection of the concept, something that is regarded as Chinese boilerplate when it comes from Chinese spokespersons. In so doing, the Dalai Lama effectively removed the one concern that has always bedeviled Chinese advocacy of its position in Tibet, the taint of illegitimacy. Not realizing how he was being used, the Dalai Lama characterized China's <laughs> insistence uh, on his repeated rejection of Tibetan independence as the result of its leadership's lack of understanding of his position. On the face of it, this is laughable. With thousands of people in China's Nationality Affairs Commission and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, one can be certain that China parses every word of the Dalai Lama. China knows what the meaning of the word is, is, with regard to the Dalai Lama. The lack of understanding comes from his side, where he presides over an exile bureaucracy with no equivalent resources or expertise in Chinese politics. And that bureaucracy has let the Chinese foreign policy establishment run rings around them. As I stated earlier, this situation is the result of the inhibitions on substantive criticism of the Dalai Lama that operate within Tibetan exile society. Indeed, the comments that my piece elicited on the Payo website are instructive. Some agreed that there was merit to what I said. One positive comment said, if a Tibetan had written this article, he would be considered a traitor. But those that were critical could not muster a rational defense of the Dalai Lama's policies in and of themselves. Rather, some maintained, I needed to realize that Tibetans were resilient and will come through all this. Otherwise, some stated that the policies were good simply because they came from the Dalai Lama. Who has more wisdom, said one, the Inji professor or Chen Rezi? <laughs> well... In this instance, it's the Yinji professor. <laughs> Until the political culture surrounding the institution of the Dalai Lama is changed so that the Dalai Lama is as answerable as anyone else for the illogical, erroneous, and negative results of his policies, 
until he is seen as no more gifted with political insight than many other ordinary Tibetans, there is little use speculating about the future of the institution in any meaningful way. The inability of Tibetans to provide a substantive check against the Dalai Lama's political policies and actions has resulted in a, move, in a movement that is now losing coherence and viability where it matters. The Dalai Lama has repeated over and over to presidents and prime ministers that he wants only autonomy, and now only cultural rights, not independence, that China is a great country and Tibet wants to be part of that great country. The game appears to be over. 